Hello, everybody. This is Parrish Alford with the Daily Journal. I'm joined now by Ole Miss Athletics Director Ross Bjork. Ross, how are you this morning? I'm doing well, Parrish. How are you? Hey, doing fine. Thanks for coming on. Just wanted no to problem. hit a uh, couple of to topics with you this morning. Uh, obviously, the uh, the NCAA case with Laramie Tunsil is fresh on everyone's mind. I, I know you're limited somewhat in, in what you can talk about that. Uh, but uh, earlier yeah. this week, uh, you mentioned uh, to the Clarion Ledger about uh, ongoing uh, investigations still with uh, women's basketball and uh, a former football employee. Uh, has anything changed there? Yeah, you know, I, I appreciate you asking that, that Parish, And uh, obviously, you know, it's something, um, you know, that any athletic program, you know, has to be uh, diligent about, you know, our compliance efforts and, and making sure we do the right thing, you know, every single day. And so, you know, there is a there is a process that we're trying to uh, to get an end result and uh, come to a conclusion on. And it does involve uh, the things you described, uh, women's basketball that happened in 2012 that we dealt with uh, very quickly and swiftly. And then some other things uh, have bubbled up. But, uh, you know, what I can say um, in terms of how we run the program and how confident we are about all of our coaching staffs and all of our sports is that we believe that we're doing things the right way and that we hope that this, uh, this end game uh, with the NCAA can, can happen uh, sooner rather than later uh, so that we can all move on and, uh, and get back to, to really doing our day jobs, uh, which is serving our student athletes and, and growing this program. So I'm confident in how we do things and uh, hopefully that end game is, uh, is coming soon. Well, in, in this day, Ross, of, of more autonomy for uh, Power Five schools, has anything really changed with how schools deal with the NCAA? I mean, the, these investigations have uh, have quite a bit of age on them now. Well, you know, I, I think, um, you know, in a, in a big picture uh, perspective, you know, I think there's a lot of things that need to change uh, regarding enforcement and, and really the whole compliance world. And, and I think there's some things that are being looked at uh, to try to be more efficient uh, in, in those things. I mean, we saw some cases uh, recently, um, particularly at Syracuse University, where that's a seven, eight-year-old uh, situation. And, and so for us, you know, three-plus years, you know, th those things are tough. Those things are tough on your programs. And so there, there has to be a better way uh, to be more efficient um, in, in wrapping these things up. And, and I think there's a lot of conversation uh, regarding that. Uh, that is taking place and will take place, uh, you know, in the future. Regarding uh, Laramie Tunsil and, and the recently uh, completed investigation mm -hmm. into his status, I know you can't uh, comment on a lot of specifics, but uh, you know, seven games is a long time there. There was a lot of uncertainty for Laramie. I'm, I'm wondering if you can tell us, did, did he consider leaving the program at any point? And, and uh, how did you guys, I guess, counsel him along those lines? You know, I think that the, the leaving the program part, I think, would have to be uh, really left to him to, to answer. What, what I can tell you as the longer the process went along, you know, we had to make sure that he had all the information. You know, um, obviously, we wanted him to play in our program. We wanted him to continue. But really, anything uh, past where we where we landed, you know, I think uh, he had to take a long look at that. And so we provided all those options to him. Uh, he had counsel that he could speak to. We, uh, we talked to folks in the NFL uh, about his future. And, uh, you know, I think the feedback, uh, we were honest with him about that feedback um, and gave that to him. And, and the other thing, you know, I think that, that that is good for college athletics right now is that we're able to protect him. So he was able to qualify for an insurance policy, two of them. Uh, one of them that protected uh, any injury uh, that he may, uh, may sustain while he plays here. And then uh, what's called loss of value insurance. And so we're able to pay for that out of the uh, NCAA Opportunity Fund. And so he's protected at a really high level, both on the disability side and on a potential loss of value uh, should he fall in a, in a draft uh, situation. But, you know, as you, as you look at uh, Laramie's uh, status right now, you know, he's projected, you know, as a top 10 pick in, in most, uh, you know, prognostications. And so, you know, I, I think um, that alone right there says that he's a great player. He's got a bright future. We protected him as much as possible with the insurance piece, gave him all the information, and ultimately he decided he wants to be around his teammates. And uh, I think that's important uh, for him to, to be part of college sports, and he wanted to fulfill that dream. 
And uh, we'll see what happens after this year. And uh, we're all assuming that he goes, that he'll be a top 10 pick, um, and, and that'll, uh, that'll play out as the season uh, comes to an end. Well, you mentioned the conversation with the NFL there regarding draft status, and we see the, we see the projections, Ross, but can you share mm-hmm. anything about uh, what the NFL might have said regarding that? Well, I, you know, I, think, you know, I think scouts and general managers want to see people play, and they want to see people play at the highest level, and obviously with five games remaining, that are all SEC games. You know, he's going to play against the best competition in college football. And, you know, so in, in a general sense, uh, that was the feedback uh, that we received uh, through our coaching staff and uh, through talks with uh, NFL executives. What, what is your response to uh, uh, Ole Miss fans, I guess, who say that uh, Laramie should have played regardless, even while the NCAA investigation was ongoing? I, I know that was a conversation. What, what's, what's your take on that? You know, I'm, I, I think the, the, the general uh, comment to that would be there's a lot more to it than meets the eye. Um, it's a lot more complicated than, uh, than what may appear on the surface. And, you know, if, if we would have taken that, that measure, then in, in the seven-game uh, suspension comes down, then, you know, do you have to forfeit those games? Is the, the season prolonged in terms of him setting out? You know, all those things come into play. And so I know that we did the right thing by withholding him. Uh, proactively that helped us in the end. Uh, Laramie understood all that. His counsel understood all of that. And ultimately we, as tough as it was to, to watch him sit there, we did the right thing. And uh, that's what we had to do to protect him, but also our program ultimately. Now you, you guys, and I'm thinking of you and, and Hugh specifically, mm-hmm. uh, have always talked about, uh, wanting to run a clean program and, and do the right thing. Football is so so large, Raw, so many fingers in the pie. And uh, I, I'm going to go back to an, a phrase a lot of us became yeah. familiar with in the 80s. But uh, how difficult is it with a program that large and, and you guys needing a large program and involvement with private money and private contributions? How, how difficult is it yeah. to maintain knowledge of all aspects of a program and maintain institutional control? Well, I think the, the first approach is uh, you, you've got to have great people. You know, you've got to have great people with, uh, with character and integrity that are operating within your program. You know, we have 242 employees, Paris, from, you know, interns to head coaches to athletic directors to graduate assistants. And so everybody that you hire has to have uh, the utmost integrity. So I think it starts with that. Then I think it starts with, uh, you know, really our core values, our, our core values uh, state integrity, um, state uh, university integration. And so we have to be part of our mission. Uh, then you have the technical aspects. So we have a head coach control manual that really uh, uh, is a blueprint for our head coaches to follow in terms of running their program with full compliance, communicating with their staff, communicating with our compliance staff. It's a very robust technical operation uh, to protect ourselves. And then you know, then you have to control what you can control. And, and that's our people. Uh, that's our, our, our education. And so we do as much, if not more, than the, most programs do around the country in terms of being proactive. And then, you know, probably what keeps us up at night would be the fear of the unknown. You know, so we do all these things. And there are certain elements that we don't know about. And that, I think, keeps an athletic director, uh, a chancellor, a president up at night is what is the fear of the unknown? And I simply can't control that. All I can control is how we run it, who we hire, the technical aspects, how robust we are, how proactive we are. And ultimately that will protect us. I think the best way possible um, in a high stakes environment, in a, a big public setting with a lot of interest. And like you said, a lot of people that want to touch our program. So uh, I think we're diligent uh, the best we can. I think we have the right people uh, running our programs. I believe in our people. And uh, we'll keep uh, keep on that same uh, course of action as we move ahead. Ross, Laramie was obviously a part of that uh, celebrated recruiting class of uh, 2013. Right. And that group will begin to break up uh, after this year. What do you think its legacy will be? Well, I, I really think that they, you know, they helped set the tone uh, for high level football uh, in this new era. You know, obviously we've had great history here. Uh, we've had our, our ups, uh, we've had some downs, uh, but plenty of ups in our program. And I, I think they helped set a new tone 
if you will, in the sort of the modern era of college football uh, under Coach Freeze. And so, you know, their platform um, will be strong, you know, for years to come. And we can build off that. We're still building off of that. And if you look at, you know, next year's class, the 16 class, you know, it's uh, it's being built uh, every bit as good as that 13 class. And so, you know, I think if you look at our team this year and some of the injuries and some of the depth uh, we're still, you know, we're still building the program, you know, three strong recruiting classes, you know, it still takes time, you know, you need four five, six, seven years of strong recruiting uh, to really be consistent in this league. And so we're still building. Uh, but I think that 13 class helped propel us. It also showed that we can do it at a high level. It gave confidence uh, to our, our university, our athletic program, and especially football. So uh, we want to finish strong this year. And uh, if those guys do have the opportunity to leave early, or like many of them will, then uh, we'll celebrate them and, uh, and help them uh, achieve their dreams. You were in the end zone at the end of the game in Memphis Saturday. And in a right. disappointing situation like that, Ross, uh, do right. you talk to coaches and players? Do you stay in the background? Uh, what, what's your approach on a day like that? You know, my, uh, my role is to support, you know, be there for them. You know, I've, I've got to believe in them. Um, really, I've, I've got to help them uh, believe, you know, in themselves, you know, more than maybe they do. Um, and so I, I think that's my role um, in those cases is to provide that support, provide that leadership that says, hey, this is one game. It doesn't define our program. You know, as tough and as uh, stinging as that loss was, it doesn't define who we are. We, we know what our program stands for. We know how capable we are of achieving it at the highest level. And so my job is to reinforce that, that we're on the right track and, uh, and really just be there to, to be a positive uh, influence. You know, you know, regardless of the scoreboard, you know, when I saw Robert Conyers walking off on his crutches, I went over and gave him a hug and I said, Hey, Robert, you know, we're going to support you. We're going to get you back. We have a great medical team and we're thinking about you, you know, so the individual moments, you know, I think ultimately, uh, really define, you know, our program uh, deep down. So that that's what I that's what I believe my role is uh, in that situation. Ten SEC coaches, including Hugh, are making at least four million dollars a year. Ross, does does that change how ADs evaluate programs, wins and losses? Uh, is anything changing there? You know, I, I think it's uh, it's market based. And so I, I don't know if it really changes uh, the fundamentals of, of how we evaluate uh, programs. Uh, you know, ultimately, I, I think it, it sort of is what it is. Um, it's the investment that uh, programs have decided to make, including ours. If you believe in the, in the people that are running your programs, um, I would say and I would argue that uh, you freeze has been worth every penny that we've spent on, on him and his staff. If you look at the growth of the, of the program athletically uh, at this university, you look at the university um, and, and all the things that are happening momentum wise, you know, I think you can argue that uh, every penny has been worth it. And, you know, we want to win more games and he gets all that and, and, and we're on the right track. Um, so I don't think it changes any part of how we evaluate. Uh, there's a few more zeros added into uh, the equations as you're negotiating, uh, you know, these contracts, but I like where we are. Uh, I think it's healthy to keep investing in, in good people and uh, to grow our programs, and, and we'll continue to, to do that. Do you see those coaching salaries continuing to rise? You know, it, it's hard to say. You know, um, you know, if you look back, uh, I remember uh, being at Missouri in, uh, I believe it was 1997, when Mac Brown became the first million-dollar coach uh, in college football. And, you know, people were like, where is, the, where is this going to end? And now we have five- and seven-million-dollar coaches. So, you know – to me, it's a it's just a you know indication of the marketplace. You know, budgets have grown, you know, uh, incrementally. You know, salaries have grown incrementally. We're providing more for our student athletes uh, academically and cost of attendance, and you know, so the world you know just keeps growing you know economically. And I and I think college athletics and universities, you know, I think are are really no different. So I don't know where the end is. I I can't tell you uh, what that looks like. Uh, obviously, there's no salary cap. In, uh, in college football coaching. Um, and so, you know, we're not going down that path, I don't think, anytime soon. That would take a Congress uh, intervention. And so, you know, to me, it is what it is. And if you believe in, in your people and you have the resources, then uh, invest. Invest the right way. 
Where are you guys, Ross, with uh, Pavilion Construction right now? What's going on? I believe I, I've seen you quoted as saying that uh, January 7th still looks good for an opening. So today we're 78 days, uh, Parrish, from opening the, the Pavilion at Ole Miss on January 7th, 2016. I, my, uh, my computer screen is uh, right over here to my left, and every day I go on the construction cam, and something changes, you know, every day. We've got the, the floor is now installed, the wood floor. They've uh, got it nailed down. They've uh, they started sanding the floor. They're actually going to start painting uh, the court and, and the outline of the playing surface uh, here in the next uh, week or so. They've got about 25% of the seats installed. We've got our center hung video board installed. We've got the ribbon board installed. We have uh, sinks and toilets and concession equipment and all those things that uh, we don't see on those cameras uh, being installed right now. So we are uh, cruising right along. We have a great contractor in BL Harbert, and uh, we're very, very confident that uh, opening day will be here in 78 days uh, to play Alabama, and uh, we can't wait. It's a game changer. We've heard, we've, you've heard us say that word uh, a lot of times, but it truly is uh, for our program going to really change the environment for our fans and our players and our, and our students coming to our game. So we're, we're excited. There, there's just no way to put it. You only get, you only get to open these buildings uh, really once uh, in a lifetime. And this is a, you know, 50 to 75 year project uh, that'll uh, leave a legacy for years to come. So when uh, January 7th arrives and uh, that first game is here, Will the, the building be 100% operational? Will the restaurants be open at that time? Is everything working on that day? Yeah, what I think the, the key word you use there is operational. Um, will it be 100% finished and completed? Absolutely not. Uh, you know, these things do take a, a little more time, but in terms of being safe, operational, concessions and restrooms and seating bowl and electronics and all those things, yes, they will be open. Uh, the restaurants will, will open on game day. They'll have to shut back down uh, during the weekday, and I believe their opening of the restaurants is sometime in mid-February um, in terms of daily use. So game day will be operational at 100% uh, capacity, and then we'll have to shut things down you know, throughout the, throughout the days uh, as they finish that project um, and truly opening 100% um, completion around the middle of February. And the restaurants were Cane's and Steak and Shake, is that right? Yeah, the Raisin Cane's, uh, which is uh, really a, a chicken place that's uh, popular among our students, and then uh, Steak and Shake. So I know that, Parrish, when we do this again, maybe we can do this over a milkshake. <laughs> I tell you what, uh, that, that sounds good. That sounds good. Is, is the North End Zone project uh, on track to begin after the season? That, that project is ongoing as well. We have a contractor on board, Anderson Construction, a Mississippi-based company. Uh, they've actually started some preliminary uh, site work that a lot of people don't notice. Uh, we're actually going to tear down part of the uh, FedEx Starnes building to accommodate the north end zone. So they're starting on that project. We have a construction trailer that's set up. And, and really the, the Saturday of the LSU game, that night, we expect there to be a bulldozer setting in the north end zone and they'll, they'll do something. It, it may be more ceremonial that night, but we'll do something to indicate that this project is starting right away. And then really, as soon as that game's over, uh, Roy Anderson uh, Construction Company will start and uh, have that project done by September 10th, uh, which is our first home game in 2016. So everything's a go, and uh, we're excited about that one as well. And that's, uh, again, going to really change the environment of uh, Vaught Hemingway Stadium on, on many levels. Ross, where are you with uh, what's going on with the track right now? We have a uh, we have a contractor um, who got that bid a few weeks ago. Excavators Incorporated, they're a Mississippi-based company, and uh, they've got a construction fence that is up right now. And so they've essentially started that project. I'm not exactly sure when they're going to start digging. I think they'll do some site prep and, and get everything ready, and they'll start digging on that. Uh, you know, here very soon and, and get that project going. So we're that that project's about a 10 month project. So we anticipate by around September 1st of 2016 for our track uh, to be completed. And, and that is just the track, correct? I mean, the uh, coaches' offices, locker areas, that sort of thing, that's, that's all pretty new and in good shape. That's correct. All that can be uh, saved. Uh, that doesn't involve any sort of uh, sinkage or anything like that with uh, what we've had to repair. 
So all that uh, is salvageable and uh, operational. Our, our coaches operate in there. Our student athletes operate in there. So it's really just the track itself that we have to excavate and, and uh, redo. Is there anything else facilities-wise uh, on the horizon? So we have the Gillum Center. The Gillum Center will start uh, construction uh, sometime in the spring of 2016. That'll take about uh, 10 months as well. That'll uh, include redoing our seating bowl for volleyball. We will take uh, uh, our weight room and training room out of the Starnes and FedEx Center and move that out to the Gillum Center. We will also redo our offices and we will redo our locker rooms for soccer, volleyball, and softball who are in that building. So that, that building will really be transformed. There'll be a new exterior as well. And so that, that's a transformation of that building. That's about a $13 million project that'll start uh, next spring and be done by early 2017. Ross, good stuff. Thanks for being with us. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks, Parrish. Have a good week. You too. Okay. Thank you.